everything you need to answer that discrete question is really in the question stem itself. And oftentimes, as you'll see in this set, those question stems are a little longer. Dorothy back for another MCAT podcast. Last week, I was five for five, I think, doing our psych so <laughs> passage. Uh, this week, we're on to a set of discrete questions. We've talked about cleansing the palate in between passages and sets of discretes and everything else. Um, coming off of what felt like basically all discrete questions last passage, yeah. moving into more discrete questions, what is what is the potential issue with students just starting to go a little bit too fast because their confidence is getting a little bit too high? <laughs> yeah. So once you get past that, okay, okay, it's all discreet. It's all discreet. Um, essentially, you just need to read really carefully, right? Because you don't have a passage to fall back on, and everything you need to answer that discrete question is really in the question stem itself. And oftentimes, as you'll see in this set, those question stems are a little longer. So you really need to make sure you are reading carefully, making sure you can rephrase that question stem or and or answer choices as needed. So you really understand what you're answering. Don't go too fast here. You don't want to accidentally choose the wrong answer. That's actually the opposite of what you actually want, right? So make sure you read the entire answer choice, read the whole question stem, and don't let yourself lose points on these discrete questions. Yeah. All righty. So let's start with question 44. An experiment is arranged in which participants spend 10 seconds, 20 seconds, or 30 seconds looking at a large complex image. The image is then removed and replaced with a second image, which is identical except for one small change. Ooh, it's like those um, those highlight magazines, like you gotta find all the yeah. differences. Uh, like where's Waldo almost? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Researchers then measure how long the subjects look at the new image before finding the change. In this scenario, the independent variable is A, whether the subjects ever find the change, B, the time spent looking for the change, C, the size and prominence of the change, or D, the time spent looking at the original image. All right, so... Here we get to, I think last time I talked about, I, I hate the confounding and non-confounding or whatever, mm. and independent and dependent variables and what they mean, because there's strict definitions around these. And I never <laughs> have learned these and, and like relegated them to memory. So yeah, of course. Uh, so let's see if I can just logic my way through this. So okay. whether the subjects ever find the change is kind of a true false type answer. Right, like yes or no. Yes or no, or exactly. Mm -hmm. And then everything else is not that. So everything else, so B is time spent looking uh, for the change. D is time spent looking at the original image. So to me, those mm -hmm. are very similar things. Yeah. Um, and so because those are very similar, time spent looking for something, I'm gonna ignore those potentially, maybe cross those out mm -hmm. in my mind. See the size and prominence of the change. So independent, oh man, it's so hard. Um, <laughs> this is a tough question for sure. Yeah, so they're looking at how long the subjects look at the new image. Mm -hmm. So to me, size and prominence of the image potentially would change how long somebody is going to look for that change. And so maybe independent means it wouldn't change that. And so I'm going to say A, just because okay. to, to me, independent seems like it wouldn't change the outcome of what they're mm -hmm. trying to measure. But I don't know okay. if that's a, a good definition. I think I'm going to modify your definition a All little right. bit here. So let's start with independent versus dependent variable. Yeah. So independent is something that you manipulate. So it's like in your research experiment, in this case, they're saying, okay, you watch for 10 seconds originally, you watch for 20 seconds, you look for 30 seconds. Or Did I say minutes or seconds? I don't know what I just said. Yeah. 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, right? That is one of the manipulations that the experimenters are doing. Okay. Um, so that is an independent variable because it's something that's being manipulated. Okay. In some ways, the image itself that is being changed is also kind of yeah 
it's not a true independent variable because it's not something that we're told changes, um, but it is a feature of the experiment for sure. It's definitely related. So independent is something you man manipulate. Dependent is something that you measure. So what are they actually measuring here? What would be a dependent variable? Uh, they're measuring the time. Yeah, the time to find the new change, yeah. right? So that would be B here. So B would be a dependent variable. Mm -hmm. The time spent looking at the original thing is actually your independent because that is the 10, 20, 30 seconds okay. um, that we established from the beginning. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. um, the MCAT also likes asking about confounding variables, mediating variables, and moderating variables. Yep. So a confounding variable is something that affects both the independent and dependent variable. So it affects essentially both the starting thing and the measured thing. Okay. Um, and so essentially by addressing and adding more controls, you can address a lot of those confounding variables, right? Um, a mediating variable is a little bit different. So a mediating variable, I just think of a mediator like in a therapy session or something. So it's like the middle man, right? Um, it's essentially the person who is in between the two people who are trying to talk things out. Mm -hmm. So mediating variables very much in the same way. So it mediates between the independent and dependent variable. So it explains the mechanism through which X influences Y. Okay. Um, so I, it's kind of like, why is that relationship there? It kind of answers that question. And then a moderating variable is a little different. I just say, while a mediating variable asks why, a moderating variable asks how much. So moderating variable is like exercise or yoga in terms of looking at workplace stress and anxiety or something or mm -hmm. depression or something like that. So if you have a link between workplace stress and anxiety and depression, maybe you introduce a moderating variable like yoga or exercise. And that is something that is going to decrease or increase the strength of that relationship between stress and anxiety mm -hmm. in a way that could moderate essentially the strength of your relationship. So okay. those are kind of the five variable definitions to be comfortable with by test day. Um, okay. I know I kind of went through them quickly, but they are pretty important. Yep. Um, That's what the yeah. rewind button is for. Yeah. <laughs> uh, go back and listen again. So so this one should have been very straightforward if you knew the definition of independent variable, meaning something that the researchers are are adjusting themselves, in which case mm -hmm. they tell you in that first sentence, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, which is the yeah. time spent looking at the image, a.k.a. D. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Got to know those definitions. <laughs> That's psych soch for you. That's why we, yeah. we talk all the time about like psych soch is that's where all the free, all the free points are because you just got to know the definitions <laughs> and it should be pretty straightforward. Right. Knowing the definitions takes time and definitely takes practice. But once you know them, it's straightforward mm -hmm. and kind of a plug and chug. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. all right. Question 45. Two groups of cats are placed in separate rooms. Room one is large with lots of exercise toys and laser pointer devices that operate automatically on timers. Room one cats exhibit exercise levels 350% greater than the control cats in room two. Cats from both rooms are then placed in a room with an electrified floor and a safe shelf while the voltage in the floor is slowly increased. Cats from room one remain on the floor for 32% more time than the control cats. This suggests that exercise down regulates blank. You've got A, baroreceptors, B, stretch receptors, C, olfactory receptors, and D, nociceptors. <laughs> so a long it, question, Stan. The, the, the student <laughs> looking at this goes, wait a minute, this is physiology, right? Mm -hmm. Why is this in the psych soch section? Yeah, so psych soch deals a lot with sensation as well. And so receptors are part of that, right? And it, they send signals to your brain. Psychology is about the brain and how it works. And so it can definitely be tested maybe in biobiochem, but also psychosoc for sure. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Well, <laughs> ba based on simple physiology, uh, and, and I hope I still remember this, uh, Barrow, uh, stretch, and olfactory receptors would not be what we're looking for. Uh, mm -hmm. D, nociceptors are pain receptors. Uh, to me, being shocked <laughs> is going to be painful, uh, right. and, and therefore the cats who are exercising more uh, have a little bit higher pain tolerance and um, are down-regulating yeah. the nociceptors. 
Yeah, exactly. So D nociceptors is exactly right. Um, it might be kind of an unexpected result because you're like, okay, wait, those are the room one cats or the exercise room cats. Shouldn't they be able to jump up to the safe shelf more easily? But they must not mind getting shocked, right? Because they can, they are more capable potentially of jumping, but they don't. Um, and so no receptors or pain receptors are definitely the ones that would make sense. Also, Ryan, I know um, maybe you can speak to this more as well, but I know that for chronic pain patients, exercise is often prescribed, I believe, as a way to kind of alleviate or facilitate some of that pain. And so I think it's similar where exercise can, um, I don't know if we know the mechanism of it fully, but I think exercise induced analgesia is a thing. Yeah. 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 I mean, you get just a standard kind of runner's high, right? Of like breaking yeah. through and, and getting that dopamine release and all the good, all the good, uh, hormones and, and, um, what do you call those neurotransmitters to, uh, right. <laughs> make you, make you feel better. Yeah, exactly. Uh, okay. So pretty straightforward one there. Moving on, 46, when professors meet with individual students during office hours, who it's like uh, some PTSD <laughs> there, they often exhibit communication styles that vary widely based on the person they are talking to. A study found that professors speaking with minority female students were much more likely to use shorter sentences with more instructions and to ask questions that revealed an assumption of lack of academic skill. These professors were demonstrating a, prejudice, B, discrimination, C, stereotyping, or D, egoism. All right, so last episode, I think we kind of defined prejudice and discrimination. Discrimination is, is kind of um, thinking something and also acting uh, yeah. on, on that kind of thought. Prejudice is just having thoughts. Uh, about mm -hmm. uh, a person or a group of people or whatever. Uh, egoism, I mean, to me, that's pretty straightforward. Like you're just egotistical, like I'm the best and right. I'm the smartest. Um, yeah. and, and that <laughs> potentially would come across if the professor was treating everyone like they were dumb. Uh, right. But this is only treating a specific uh, subset of people and to mm -hmm. me, that's stereotyping them, right? To to stereotype minority female students as if they're not smart enough to understand how I'm going to talk normally to other people, then mm -hmm. uh, that's stereotyping. So I'd go with C here. Okay. You're definitely along the right track. It is not C, actually. Oh, no. But <laughs> so a stereotype is very broad. So it's kind of a prevalent, oversimplified idea or set of ideas about a certain group. So a stereotype would be like minority females aren't as smart like that would be a stereotype but in order to actually speak differently to these people that is a behavior that's an action oh right. so it's discrimination yeah <laughs> so it is discrimination yeah <laughs> interesting so stereotype is a little so you so, mentioned that prejudice is an idea or attitude and yeah. that is true so i think it's stereotype is the broadest form of that where you're like oh people who have red hair are annoying. Like that's a common hey, one. That's hey, hey, I'm a ginger. <laughs> <laughs> um, like that is a stereotype because it's very broad, not specific to a certain person. Yeah. Um, prejudice is like, I have that stereotype maybe, but I'm also saying like, oh, this person is annoying because they have blank or whatever characteristic. So it's like forming a negative opinion about a specific group or person or thing. And then Discrimination is acting upon that. So a behavior or action that results from your negative attitude. Interesting. Okay. There you go. <laughs> so stereotyping. Nuanced definitions. Yeah. Stereotyping <laughs> prejudice. Very similar there. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. 47. All right. 47. A parent tells his child that if she spends an hour practicing the piano that evening, she'll be allowed to skip her chores the next morning. The parent is using A, positive punishment, B, negative punishment, C, positive reinforcement, D, negative reinforcement. And the MCAT loves these kinds of questions. <laughs> yes, I've seen this way too much and I still never understand it. Um, <laughs> so a parent tells his child that if she spends an hour practicing the piano, so you got to practice the piano, you can skip chores. Mm -hmm. So, okay. This, uh, I, I think the definition is always, 
when I try to use logic on these questions, it doesn't work because positive and negative doesn't mean what we think positive and negative means in this situation. And if I I remember correctly, positive means you're adding something and negative means Mm -hmm. you're taking something away. Amazing, Um, yeah. Okay, so the answer should be something negative, either negative punishment Mm -hmm. or negative reinforcement uh, because we're taking away chores. Yeah, Um, exactly. And so it doesn't seem like punishment, right? Because the child's not being punished. They're like, hey, do this thing and you don't have to... You don't have to do your chores. So to me, that's negative reinforcement, potentially. Yeah, it is negative reinforcement. So the punishment piece is like decreasing a behavior. Reinforcement means you're increasing a behavior. So the behavior here is practicing piano. The parent wants to increase that. Mm -hmm. And to do that, they're going to reinforce it by taking away chores. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is one I've I've had too many of these where (laughs) just normal logic doesn't work because it's it's the words don't mean what you think they mean. Right, and, yeah. And so it's, that's a, a much harder one to logic. But luckily, my, my brain's working this morning and I remembered, uh, and hopefully everyone watching and listening will remember, positive and negative for the psych social psych section, at least in terms of punishment and reinforcement, do not mean good and bad, um, <laughs> right? Because I think yeah. the easy answer here is like, oh, that's positive reinforcement because you're like, you're all happy and positive and I'm going to take something right. away, which is good and that's positive. Uh, but that's just not what it means here. <laughs> right. So if it were positive reinforcement, maybe the kid would get like ice cream or something for practicing piano, but you're adding something good. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So discretes are done. We're winding down. Students are like, oh, I'm so close to <laughs> the finish there. line. Almost there. <laughs> but there's still more. So uh, stay tuned for next week. All right. See you next week.